On Sunday, August 22nd, 2004, two days after my wife, Susan Sutton's birthday, we were having a family get together, our son, Christopher, and his girlfriend, Juliet, my law partner, Teddy Montoto. We had a birthday cake. John and Susan lived in a very fancy neighborhood, Carl Gables. John was a local attorney. The firm had had a very successful week. The firm got a settlement over a million dollars. After dinner was over, we were watching the Olympics and swimming and diving. Everything was fine that evening. Everybody was relaxed. John and Susan's son, Christopher, and his girlfriend, Julia Driscoll, had plans to go to the movies, so they left. Shortly thereafter, my law partner, Teddy Montoto, left. Approximately 10 o'clock, I decided to go in to bed. Susan retired to one bedroom, John to the other. Susan oftentimes slept in the second room because her husband, John, snored. Settling into the evening, unaware that at that time, about four blocks away, there was a man who had driven up Glock 9mm semi-automatic pistol in his waistband with one intention. He was there on a mission, a mission to murder John and Susan. Next thing you know, I saw someone come in. He took out his Glock. I heard a bang, a big bang. I was being shot. And the bullets even broke the headboard, shattered the glass, the mirror. John Sutton flipped out of the bed, landed on the floor, and then the gunman turned towards Susan and shot her six times. The gunman then turned back to the master bedroom, fired more times at John, emptying the gun. I knew that I had been shot in the head. I needed assistance, and I went for a telephone. Carl Gibbles 911. Somebody came in and shot me. I need police and I need an ambulance. Susan Sutton was assassinated in her bed, didn't have a chance. And John Sutton should have died for all intents and purposes, but did not. My name is Karen Kagan. I was a prosecutor on homicide duty, and I went into that house. I was able to see the bullet holes and the blood on the floor and the blood in the bathroom. Most remarkably, nothing else in that house was disturbed. There was beautiful jewelry on the vanity, undisturbed. It was clear this was no burglary. It was a premeditated effort to make sure that they were dead. I could not imagine that anyone would want to kill us. The question was, who done it? Secrets, lies, and alibis. Tonight's 48 Hours Mystery. Mystery continues in 90 seconds. Everybody says it was somewhat of a miracle that I survived. I lost a tremendous amount of blood. Just hours after someone broke into John Sutton's home, murdered his wife, and tried to kill him, doctors weren't sure he would live. They apparently gave me last rites. They thought that I was gone. When you got to the hospital to see your father, tell me what you saw. Almost unrecognizable person. Melissa Sutton was 18, a freshman in college. Her mother was dead. Her father had been shot multiple times, twice in the head. The fact that I knew his hands and I knew his ears and his skin tone, I could tell that this kind of disfigured person was my dad. She knew him, but he had a harder time recognizing her. You cannot see me now. You don't even see a shadow. No. 
John Sutton woke up in intensive care, blind. The magnitude of my injury, the facial pain and the loss of the eyesight was just so huge. You must have been racking your brain, thinking, who could have possibly have done this? I certainly was. And I thought people were trying to kill me when I was in the hospital. I felt that I wasn't safe. I wanted to get out of there. It was just one big mess. And John still hadn't heard what happened to his wife. I remember asking Melissa, how's mom doing? She had been told by the police not to tell me about Susan. Later on, I was told that she passed away. Melissa? What kind of woman was your mom? Intelligent, confident. Awesome. Oh, you got mommy. <laughs> the kind of person who's in their 40s but wants to take violin classes and calculus classes because she just wants to be better. And more than anything, she wanted to be a great mother. Once the head nurse of a surgical intensive care unit, she gave her career up in the late 70s when she and John adopted their first child, Christopher. That was the happiest day of her life. It was absolutely the happiest day of her life. Susan's sister, Mary Marie. I heard her on the telephone. I could hear her screaming from Florida, <laughs> you know, how happy she was and how thrilled she was. Almost seven years later, they adopted Melissa. She loved those children. Hi, Christopher. And she loved them unconditionally. Now, those children were planning their mother's funeral. While police scoured the crime scene, seeing Susan Sutton's jewelry and John Sutton's wallet untouched on a dresser. Take the wallet, easy cash, at least. But nothing was taken. This person had a mission. Miami-Dade detective Rosanna Cordero hoped John, even with a serious head injury, could help her. He remembered bits and pieces. He thought he remembered a figure at the door. He might be a black man or wearing all black clothing. He was not sure. So with that kind of spotty memory, the information he provided wasn't very helpful. No, it wasn't. She thought she'd have more luck with Teddy Montoto, John's law partner. Teddy told her he was on the phone with John's wife, Susan, and heard gunfire. So he raced to the scene, arriving just after police. I was the one who told him that Susan had died. And he was very emotional about it. And then Teddy said something surprising. He was a marksman. And he'd been shooting a gun earlier that day. He's a competitive shooter. That's something that he did as a hobby. That raised our eyebrows. Detective Cordero immediately sent Teddy's gun in for testing, and she pushed him for more information about his late night phone call with Susan. He was not forthcoming with me. She suspected Teddy was hiding something. He's asked to submit to a polygraph, which he does, and he fails, especially in regards to his relationship with Susan. The interrogation continued until Teddy finally revealed his secret. He did, in fact, confess to having a sexual relationship with Susan. Did that make him a suspect in your mind? It did. Obviously, he has a motive, a motive at least to kill John, maybe not necessarily Susan. But love triangles can drive people to do very extreme behavior. But Teddy's gun didn't match the murder weapon, and police were able to confirm he wasn't in the Sutton home during the shooting. As for the polygraph, Police say he failed because he was covering up the affair, hoping to keep it from John. That was a pretty big surprise. How did you deal with that betrayal? I wasn't very happy with it. Very, very upset. Up until that point, John and Teddy had a strong working relationship, and their law firm had just gotten one of their biggest settlements ever, more than a million dollars. They had been very successful in their civil litigation, and along the way had made some enemies. In fact, John had had death threats against him. Police investigated every one of them, but they all had alibis. It was that point that I started interviewing some of John's closest friends. Lead detective Larry Bellew says there was one name that kept coming up. And they said, you need to look at Christopher Sutton. I said, Christopher Sutton, the son? Absolutely. Bellew thought it odd 
that fingers were being pointed at John and Susan's son Christopher, then 25 years old. For months since the shooting, Christopher had been right by his father's side. And when John finally left the hospital, he moved in with his son. But police were hearing alarming stories about Christopher. That he would like to have his parents dead. He actually choked his mother one time, saying that he could kill her. The son, who once seemed so devoted, was now their prime suspect. I didn't do it. I never had anything to do with it. The Polynesian Islands of Samoa in the South Pacific Ocean, nearly 7,000 miles from the Miami home where Susan and John Sutton were viciously attacked. What happened here, more than 15 years ago, police say, may hold the clue to solving the case. We learned that Christopher Sutton had been sent away to a, uh, a behavioral school by his parents. When he was just 16, John and Susan sent their son here. Christopher, they say, had been getting into lots of trouble. We were told that there was oppositional defiant disorder or conduct defiant disorder, those sort of things. He was in and out of more than half a dozen schools. I was routinely driving him to school, dropping him off at the front door, and he was routinely going out the back door and doing other things. Skipping school, though, was the least of their problems. Susan's sister, Mary. He and some other kids broke into a teacher's house and trashed the inside of the house and spray painted the inside of the house. He was arrested. We were sued. $50,000 in damage. Perhaps more. Were you an out of control teenager? Out of control? <laughs> I mean, like, I definitely wanted to do my own thing. I was definitely into body piercings and tattoos, you know, things my parents absolutely hated. I really wasn't doing anything that was horribly wrong. But Mary says if Christopher didn't get his way, he could get extremely angry. Christopher had a rifle. It was not loaded. He pointed it at Susan and Melissa. And he told them that it was loaded and he was going to shoot them. You threatened your mother at gunpoint. You threatened to kill her. Uh, no. No? No. His parents, to me, always seemed a little bit harsh on him. Christopher's friend Eric Polk says the Suttons tended to overreact. And it was rough on him. Perhaps, but when Christopher was 16, things really escalated. Susan called me and said, we've got a problem. In Christopher's room, Susan found a note. It was a plan to kill his parents for the inheritance. I saw it. I read it. It was there. How did he react when this happened? It wasn't his fault. He was just kidding. He wasn't serious. But the Suttons were. They were frightened, and they wanted Christopher out of the house. You got a restraining order against your 16-year-old son. Correct. He was a valued member of our household. Eric invited Christopher to live with his family. The judge agreed. He went to school when he was supposed to go to school, and he didn't cause any problems living with us. And then, three weeks later... It was a Friday night, I believe. Two men came to get him. They were trying to wrestle him across my lawn. Christopher was shipped off to Samoa, a place called Paradise Cove. But this was no vacation. It was a hardcore behavior modification program for troubled boys. Randy Rogers' parents sent him here when he was 17. Okay. Yeah. If he didn't follow every rule, he says, punishments were severe. You would go to like the box for a day. The box? Yeah, like the isolation box. In 1998, 48 Hours, investigating a story of abuse here, filmed the isolation box. But Randy says even worse things went on at Paradise Cove in the early days of the program when Christopher first got there. They would tie them with, with duct tape. They took them to some compound that was in the mountains, left them hogtied there. A year into Paradise Cove, Christopher sent a video message home to his parents. Hi, Mom and Dad. I want to 
want to tell you that uh, I don't feel like you guys love me. I feel that like I'm just, I'm just been, I've been stuck here just to get me out of your hair. You guys still dislike me for some reason because even though my wishes aren't to be here, I don't get them. They don't come true. John, Susan, and Melissa traveled to Samoa to see for themselves what it was like. Was he happy to see you? Absolutely. Christopher said he tried telling them about abuse. Did I believe it? No. You didn't believe it? I didn't believe it. Can't imagine that that's what was happening. Christopher was hoping to leave Paradise Cove forever on his 18th birthday but his father got a court order to keep him there for another year. He was, shall we say, fighting the program. Randy says he could only imagine how angry that would have made Christopher. When you learned about the shooting at the Sutton home, what were you thinking? I was thinking that Chris might have been behind it. You, you can understand how he may have wanted to exact revenge yeah. against his parents for his time at Paradise Cove. Uh -huh. To the point of murder. In 2000, Paradise Cove, with a dwindling enrollment and accusations of abuse, shut down. But whatever happened to Christopher there was a long time ago. Christopher was now 25, and as far as John was concerned, a loving son who, after the shooting, wanted to take care of him. I said, don't live with Christopher. I think Christopher had something to do with this. He was very angry with me about that. I didn't suspect him. And of course, I wouldn't have wanted it to be Christopher. I mean, that's the worst thing. But Mary is sure Christopher was behind the shooting of his father and the murder of his mother. Christopher isn't like you and me. Christopher's not like other people. There's something missing. The night before the funeral is when I was convinced that Christopher had something to do with it. She says Christopher talked about what happened. He sat there and he said, oh, Susan was shot more than one time. He was describing how the person came in to the house and went down the hallway. So Christopher was familiar with details about this shooting that had not yet been released. Yes, the blood drained from my body. I looked at Christopher and I thought, you killed her, you did it. But Christopher was nowhere near his parents' house when they were attacked. He and his girlfriend were at the movies, seen here on the theater's security cameras. If Christopher didn't shoot his parents, who did? in shock. It doesn't even seem real that it could have even happened. Christopher Sutton says he was horrified when he found out about his mother and father. He started bawling his eyes out. He seemed like he was devastated. Christopher's then fiance, Juliet Driscoll, says she was reeling herself. I was in shock at that point. Your entire world just blew up. Juliet met Christopher when she was just 17. He was 19 and just back from Samoa. The Sutton, she says, treated her like a daughter. Susan kind of taught me about like makeup and clothes and all that sort of stuff. You know, John was always just like really supportive of me. John even gave Juliet a job in his law office. And for the most part, John and Susan financially supported her and Christopher. They only wanted what was best for us. Who could have done this? Was it random? Wasn't it random? Who did you think had done it? I had no idea. I said, Christopher, can I speak to you for a moment? I, he said, absolutely. Detective Rosanna Cordero met Christopher at the crime scene shortly after he'd been told about the shooting. I remember he had a couple of tears come down his face. But before she could even offer condolences, he said something to her that just didn't seem right. He said to me, we had dinner here at the house but well, we left around nine and we went to the movies. Do you want my ticket stubs? So he was offering you an alibi? Yes. 
that's really weird. It's unusual. You offered up an alibi before she even asked for one. Absolutely. Why? Because of Teddy's interrogation. Teddy Montoto, the man who was secretly having an affair with Susan, had already told Christopher about his police interrogation. Christopher says he assumed he was next. So he told Cordero where he was during the shooting. And I recovered the surveillance tape of Christopher walking out of the movie theater. Here he is with Juliet leaving the theater a little before midnight, but something caught Cordero's eye. The first thing he does as he's walking out, he's not even out of the theater, is he gets on his cell phone. Lead detective Larry Bellew ordered Christopher's phone records. We saw a particular number that came up several times. 331 times to be exact in the weeks leading up to and right after the murder. We identified that number as belonging to an uh, individual by the name of Garrett Kopp. A man named Garrett Kopp had been arrested less than 24 hours after the shooting for assaulting someone with a gun in another part of Miami. He was now out on bail. Detective Bellew immediately called the arresting officer. Now please tell me you still have that gun. He did. And it turned out to be a match. It was the same gun used in the Sutton shooting. 21-year-old Garrett Kopp was brought in for questioning. I had to get something out of him. Denial, denial, denial. It was a tense interrogation. He continued to deny, deny. After six hours of questioning, he finally broke. Garrett Cobb confessed. What was the plan? Go on that soon. He said, look, you're going to have to protect me. I did it, but I did it because Christopher threatened to kill me and my son. Who did he want you to shoot? Garrett. Garrett told police the plan to kill the Suttons was all Christopher's idea. Who got you the gun to use? He actually drew a sketch as to how he got in the house. Spine glass door on the back patio. Was that door unlocked when you got there? Yep. Did Chris tell you he left it unlocked? Yep. Garrett went straight to the bedrooms where he said Christopher told him he'd find the Suttons. Shot John Sutton shot Susan Sutton. Do you recall how many times you shot her? No, sir. Garrett says Susan was under the covers when he fired. There was actually bullet holes through the comforter. So what he told me matched. I knew he had, had done this. Garrett Cobb was arrested. I did not have enough for a warrant for Christopher. Police needed more than Garrett's word that Christopher put him up to it. The next person I knew that probably had direct knowledge of all this was his fiance. Juliet Driscoll was brought in for questioning. I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing. She denied knowledge of anything. The fact that people could even think that I would know something like that. And she continued to deny for hours. 13 hours, none of which was taped by police. Like that I would let something like that happen to John and Susan. She says police yelled and threatened her with arrest. No. She was never under arrest. I, I never threaten her with that. But Juliet says she felt pressured and told them what she did know, that Christopher had a deep-seated resentment towards his parents for sending him to Samoa. He believed that he was entitled to have whatever he wanted. If he wanted this car, he should be able to have this car. If he wanted the condo, he should be able to have the condo because I deserve this. They sent me to Samoa. They deserve to pay for what they did. And for the most part, the Suttons did pay. They paid rent, they paid car payments, they paid bills, they took us on vacations. But he wanted more. But he wanted more. He said he could find somebody to kill his parents. That he could find a hitman to take out his parents. And it would be easy. I listened to it for six years. He said it for years and years and years. Did he talk to you about what your lives would be like after his parents were gone, when he would inherit the estate? Mm-hmm. What yeah. did he say? Things would be good. Because we wouldn't have to worry about money. Juliet says she never told anyone because she didn't believe Christopher was serious. It was like the boy who cried wolf. You know, you hear something so many times and you just, you, you don't think about it. And then, shortly before the murder... There was a fight. Over what? It was over a bill not being paid. Susan Sutton refused to pay Christopher's car insurance bill. The only times he would really like 
get like really angry would be when they wouldn't give him what he wanted. Julia told police Christopher was furious. He knew his father had just received a million dollar plus legal settlement. And with that information, I had enough at that point to get a warrant for Christopher Sutton. But Christopher was nowhere to be found. I got a call from one of the detectives. I'd like to come by and talk to you. She said, don't let anybody in the house. Don't answer the door till I get there. Don't pick up the phone. He must have been like, what the heck? I'm coming over to see you. Stay where you are. Did I think Christopher would come back to try to finish it off? Yeah. Detective Cordero was dreading what she was about to do. Tell John Sutton his son was behind the shooting. I know I told him that what I'm about to say is going to be hard for you to accept. But trust me, every road leads back to Christopher. I was just at that point so shell-shocked. For almost two weeks, Christopher was on the run before police found him. Cops arrested 25-year-old Christopher Sutton. John Sutton didn't want to believe it, but what he was hearing was starting to make sense. When I was told that Garrett was the shooter, and of course I put that together, Garrett and Christopher were like twins. But I don't know if you could actually prove this case to a jury without having Garrett cop. But if prosecutors Kathleen Hogue and Karen Kagan wanted Garrett to testify, it was going to cost them. The death penalty was taken off the table. Garrett would get a deal, just 30 years for shooting John and Susan. Garrett Cop is a, a drug addict, a little thug. Christopher's attorney, Bruce Fleischer. He needed a way out to help himself, and he told the detectives about Chris Sutton. He basically uh, kept his ass out of the electric chair. Garrett is now saying that Christopher promised him $100,000 to kill the Suttons. Did you ask Garrett Cop? to kill your parents? Absolutely not. So Garrett Cop is a liar? Oh, absolutely. I believe we can win this case. He's about to get his opportunity. All right. As the trial begins, John Sutton sits far from his son. Ms. Kagan, opening statement, you may proceed. Prosecutors immediately tell the jury how close Christopher was to admitted hitman Garrett Cop. They were friends for years. Over the years, they were dope smoking buddies. Christopher did nothing but sell drugs the whole time he got back from Samoa, all the time taking money from his father. The plan was for Garrett Cop to go in the Sutton's home and do the shooting. And then he would get paid when the defendant got his money. Uh, yeah, you can bring Mr. Cop back out. In shackles, Garrett Cop takes the stand. Where was Mr. Sutton when you shot at him initially? On the bin. Who was the person with whom you were in a plan to shoot John and Susan Sutton? Chris. Chris Sutton. Christopher's defense needs to prove Garrett is lying. They zero in on the tough interrogation by police. They got aggressive with you, didn't they? Somewhat. Got pushy a little bit. Leaned up against me. Yeah, like this? Yeah. That's what they're saying. Garrett. Garrett. Something like that. You need to tell us something, Garrett, because they're going to fry your ass in the electric chair. Hi, Excuse me. Excuse Garrett would have said Mother Teresa did it to get himself a deal, to get himself out of the death penalty, to get, him out, get, get himself out of that situation. Sir, you can come forward, please. But incredibly, it wasn't the first time prosecutors say Christopher had tried to execute such a plan. So would you tell the members of the jury uh, your first and last name? Jose Peon, P-E-O-N. Jose Pion is an ex-con with a murder conviction on his juvenile rap sheet. Pion met Christopher in 1999, about a year after he returned from Samoa. He asked me if I knew of any hitman that would uh, kill his parents. Was he joking or did he seem serious? He seemed serious. Uh, he said that his parents were um, worth about 500000 to a million dollars and they had some property and um, life insurance. I mean, like, I don't know where, I mean, like, I don't know where he came up with that stuff. He's a liar, too. He, yeah, about, the, about that, absolutely. Then Detective Bellew tells the jury about what he believes is a defining moment in the case, 
After arresting Christopher, he showed him Juliet's statement incriminating him. Well, I showed him the comments about we're going to be better off after they're gone. At that point, he almost immediately dropped his head to the table, started crying, and said, I'm To the detective, Christopher's reaction appeared to be an admission of guilt. But Christopher says he only cried because he believed police were setting him up. You know they forced somebody to lie. It, it's, 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 it's hard to swallow. Mr. Driscoll, if you'll come forward, stand in front But of our would the woman please, who right, once right planned right to marry Christopher now right, offer testimony that could put him away for life? And what did he express to you was his opinion about his mother? She was a bitch. Because he felt that she wouldn't give him what he wanted and what he deserved. And that being money? Yes. And she tells the jury how angry he was about Samoa. He would say they deserve to die. Good afternoon, Ms. Driscoll. But on cross-examination, Juliet says she only told the police incriminating information about Christopher after they threatened her with arrest. She was threatened with a death penalty. She was threatened with going down. But sh she's a liar, too. In, in part, yeah. But Juliet says everything she told the police was, in the end, true. She insists, though, that she never knew Christopher would actually try and kill his parents. I did not know at all that he was behind this. No. You didn't believe he was going to do it, did you? No. And then, in a moment, the defense team was hoping for. Juliet, a prosecution witness, raised doubt about Christopher's guilt before the jury. I'm still confused about the whole matter. I don't know if he did it or not. Nobody knows what really happened except for him and Garrett. But by now, John Sutton has a pretty good idea. After hearing the evidence, he's convinced his son is responsible, and he takes the stand. That I had two bullets go in here, and two which went out over here. Prosecutors asked John about his troubled relationship with his son after Samoa. Did your son ever complain to you about money? Yeah. And the complaints continued after the shooting, too. Coming home from the hospital, John says, Christopher wanted control over the finances. I didn't want him on the bank account. A father helping prosecutors convict his own son, the boy he had raised for 25 years. Do you still love Christopher? I would have to say that I do not. And it's hard. I can't connect the dots between what he was doing at age five and what happened after age 13. Your father told me that he no longer loves you. I can't control how he feels. How does it make you feel? It hurts. I mean, it definitely hurts that he no longer loves me. And I've always considered him my father, and you know, like he, you know, and, that, and I always will. Now, it's up to Christopher to convince the jury of that love and his innocence. Do you swear for me that the evidence you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. It's the moment Christopher Sutton has been waiting for. I think anyone who is innocent or wrongfully accused would, would want to get up there and, and speak their mind. It's my word against Garrett's word. It's what it all boils down to. He paints Garrett Cop as an insatiable drug fiend. Constant. Constant drug habit. I mean, like, did drugs all day. Christopher claims Garrett broke into his parents' home in a desperate bid to steal marijuana. All day long, a hopped-up Garrett had been calling him for drugs. I, I kind of told him, no, 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 no. Christopher says he kept drugs boxed up in the closet of his old bedroom where his mother often slept, and Garrett knew it. How much marijuana did you store in these boxes? In the, in the top box, about two pounds. And what was the value of that? 7,000 bucks. Once inside, Christopher claims, Garrett panicked when he saw John and Susan awake and shot them. Is it possible that this was a robbery gone bad? No, no. It was an assassination. But Christopher says he had no reason to want his parents dead. He got over his anger about being sent to Samoa long ago. When I more matured, I realized it wasn't something they did to me maliciously. 
they did what they thought was in my best interest. He even tells the jury Paradise Cove turned out to be good for him. Benefited from the program. Yes. But then, in an unexpected moment, he becomes highly emotional when discussing his alleged mistreatment there. How were you feeling physically during that time? I was what I was what they called in denial. You need a break. Yeah. Christopher's surprising breakdown on the stand is evidence, prosecutors say, that he's still haunted by his experience. His only emotional reaction was about himself. It was not about what had happened to his parents. Hopefully that made an impact on the jury. Not a tear for his mother. Not a tear. Every one of those bullets was Christopher saying to his parents, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, you owe me. He's greedy and he's lazy and he believes that he's entitled. Is there enough evidence in this case to convict my client of this crime? And the answer is no, because what is the evidence? Forced statements, cop statement is a total lie. He's the killer. It's now up to the jury. All right, everyone, uh, we understand the uh, jury has uh, reached a verdict. After a day and a half of deliberations, we, the jury, find the defendant Christopher Patrick Sutton guilty of first degree murder is charged. You were stunned at the verdict. Absolutely. I definitely thought I was going to be acquitted. Before sentencing, an emotional John Sutton addresses the court. Regardless of the result, this is a bad case. I lost Susan. I lost Christopher long before that. I lost my eyesight. He doesn't ask for leniency. A few feet away, another father sat grieving his loss, Garrett's dad, Mitchell. Can you question yourself as to... <sighs> You're a father of a murderer. <laughs> thought I taught him right from wrong. I'm just sorry it happened to, son, to the hands of my son. Christopher is sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. His sister Melissa says she'll never speak to him again. You know, my parents were the best parents, and the fact that one child did something awful does not mean that they didn't, like, love him unconditionally. They did everything they could to give him every opportunity that he deserved, and, and he just didn't take advantage of it. But the whole trial kind of opened the wound back up, you know? The loss of my mom, the blindness of my dad, and the loss of my brother. Do you think about your family? All the time, absolutely. You know? I remember all the good times. I remember all the bad times, too. I mean, like, it hurts me to, to, to hear them, you know, think that I had anything to do with this. It's, it's unfortunate. As for their father, John's focus right now is getting his eyesight back. At Scapin's Eye Research Institute in Massachusetts, work on optic nerve regeneration is promising. Put your chin down a little more. And at Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Here we go. Now I'm looking right at your optic nerve. Dr. Joseph Rizzo is ready to start discussing electronic technology, implanting a device around the back of the eye. Our job is to try to make you as functional as you can be. While he waits for a breakthrough, John Sutton remarkably continues to practice law. He memorizes his briefs. X T R U. And with the help of an aide, he's winning cases much like he used to. And he has a new love interest. The world of darkness he now lives in is slowly brightening with each passing day. It's really almost like I'm another person. There's so many changes in my life. It would be completely understandable if you felt sorry for yourself sometimes. Do you? Doesn't do any good. I don't believe in feeling sorry for myself because then you're just wallowing in disaster. I just decided that I wasn't going to sit around for the rest of my life. 
and get bored. So I have done everything that I can possibly do without hesitation.